In the 13th chapter of the New Testament book, The Acts of the Apostles, the Apostle Paul travels to the city of Antioch of Pisidia, located in Western Asia Minor. There he visited the synagogue to try to persuade the people that Jesus was the promised Messiah, a man from the line of King David himself. However, before Paul launches into his speech, notice how he addresses his audience. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. That's kind of odd language. Why would Paul say, men of Israel and you who fear God? If he was speaking to a Jewish audience, this might seem like a redundant statement. Well, the phrase translated from the Greek as you who fear God might actually be a technical term, a term referring to non-Jewish people who were interested in Jewish beliefs and practices, so interested that they would actually attend synagogue meetings, even when they had not yet converted themselves. The Book of Acts consistently differentiates between Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as Paul bounces from one synagogue to another around the Mediterranean. For example, in Acts 17, he arrives in Thessalonica, and upon visiting the synagogue, he convinces both Jews and Greeks. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the God-fearing Greeks. Again, notice that word God-fearing, and notice the differentiation between Jews and Greeks. Variations of this phrase, God-fearing or pious, appear again and again in the book of Acts, and seem to reference these Greeks and Romans who were interested in Jewish customs. Josephus mentions a similar phenomenon. In his book, The Jewish War, he mentions non-Jewish women in the city of Damascus, adopting Jewish religious practice. And he says that the Jews in the city of Antioch always drew to their religious ceremonies a great multitude of Greeks whom they made in some way a part of themselves. As we see in these texts, non-Jews were apparently attending local synagogues and affiliating with local Jewish communities outside of Judea. This might point to the social context of Paul's so-called missionary journeys, traveling to local synagogues and finding a receptive audience among so-called non-Jewish God-fearers. But do we see something similar in the archaeological record? So far in this series, we focus mostly on the regions in and around Judea, and there are some prominent examples of ancient synagogues in this region. There is a synagogue at Masada, a beautifully preserved example on the shores of the Sea of Galilee at the town of Magdala, and another example in the Golan Heights at the town of Gamla. But in the Book of Acts, Paul visits synagogues in the other corners of the Roman Empire, Syria, Asia Minor, and Greece. Scholars sometimes call these Jewish communities the Jewish Diaspora, referring to the Jews living outside of Judea. And sure enough, archaeologists have discovered ancient synagogues all over the Mediterranean world. One example was discovered in the city of Priene, located in Western Asia Minor. There, the Jewish community converted a house into a synagogue. Archaeologists discovered a niche in the wall where they once kept their Torah scroll, as well as several images of the menorah engraved in the stones of the synagogue. Another prominent example is the synagogue in the city of Sardis, located northeast of Priene. There, archaeologists discovered a huge synagogue that dates to around the 3rd or 4th century, consisting of a long assembly hall and an impressive shrine for the Torah scroll. So even though they are relatively rare, diaspora synagogues are archaeologically attested throughout the eastern Mediterranean. But what evidence do we have for non-Jewish people joining the community? Over the decades, several inscriptions have come to light using the epithet God-fearer or God-fearing, which might be archaeological evidence of the technical term that we saw in our textual evidence. Many of these inscriptions are dedications from wealthy benefactors in the community. For example, check out this inscription from Tralles in Western Asia Minor, which is a dedication from a pagan woman who paid to refurbish the local synagogue. This is a donor inscription. A modern analogy would be a rich philanthropist donating money to a building project on a college campus. Sometimes the whole building is named after the philanthropist, or sometimes just a single room, and sometimes you'll just see plaques on the wall or stone pavers that name the donors. This example from Tralles is kind of the same idea. Some woman named Capitolina, probably a wealthy local benefactor, donated to the synagogue. She was a member of a powerful local family that included a proconsul of Asia Minor, and her husband apparently was a senator and a priest of Zeus. In other words, 
this woman was probably pagan, but she calls herself a God-fearer, using a Greek word related to the same word used in the Book of Acts to describe God-fearing Greeks. Thus, she may have been one of these non-Jewish individuals curious about Jewish customs, and who loosely affiliated herself with the community. Donor inscriptions happen to be the most common attestation of God-fearers in the Roman Empire. At the Sardis Synagogue that I mentioned earlier, archaeologists discovered six inscriptions that label donors as God-fearers. Two of the inscriptions were prominently displayed in a fancy mosaic in the synagogue's entryway. Another example was discovered in the city of Aphrodisias, where archaeologists found two big marble blocks listing the names of dozens of people who had donated to the Jewish community. It lists 68 Jews, three proselytes, and 54 people called God-fearers. These two terms, proselyte and God-fearers, appear to be two technical categories within the Jewish community. Now, although much of this evidence dates to a few centuries after Paul, many scholars believe that these inscriptions can help us understand the social context of early Christianity, help us understand how it developed in the first century. Though it started as a sect of Judaism, the early Jesus movement apparently attracted new members from pagans that were involved in local Jewish communities. This is one reason why the scholar of early Christianity, Paula Fredrickson, calls Paul the pagan's apostle. Although he was Jewish and operated in Jewish communities, he also found an audience among the non-Jewish inhabitants of the Roman Empire as he traveled across the Eastern Mediterranean. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. That was the latest episode in Pathios' series, Excavating the History of the Bible. Click on the playlist on screen to catch up on all previous episodes.